All of my teachings, when I teach, it's about empowerment. How do we empower ourselves? How do we walk as the salt and the light uh, on this planet? And, and so many times, it, it, it seems like it's the things that we do to ourselves that prevent us from walking as with all power, dominion, and authority. And so what we're learning is how do we get these things out of our life so we can move forward and become and walk as a son and daughter of God, not just a child in Christ, right? But with that, some, there's some growth and there's some pain because we have to, one, admit that we have a problem, and two, then we have to address that problem and figure out how we can take care of it because it's not about us. It's about who we represent, and it's about everyone else so that they, they can also learn to walk in the, in the light of, of God, right? So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. This is one of the stumbling blocks that's uh, come up. And uh, this book was done by, let me get his name. Yeah, I got it up there. It's a discussion, Dr. James Richards, How to Stop the Pain. So this book is available. Is this available at the back? It will be on Wednesday, available at the back. So you can buy the book, so that way you'll know if I make any mistakes or not. So don't buy the book. No, I'm kidding. So, introduction, in daily life, as in our businesses, people experience pain and failure while trying very hard to be happy. So, what's failure? You know, that's one of the questions. We experience pain and failure. You know, pain you're going to have with you always, but suffering is a choice. And we've got to understand that there's a difference between pain and suffering. Pain, pain is momentary. Suffering is on and on and on and on. So we have to learn about how do we just have a pain and move on and not live in this suffering place that, you know, it, it inhibits us from all the greatness that God has for us, okay? So what is failure? I have, anyone can, give me, a, give me a definition of failure. What's that? Quitting. Okay, you're, you're way ahead of the game, but that's true. The truth is the only failure is when you stop trying. There is no failure. The world tries to set up failure for you, but the only failure you have in your life is when you stop trying. Then you fail, right? So let's remember that. Only failure you have is when you stop trying because all the rest of the stuff, you'll be used for your growth. Okay, maybe I didn't make it in this, but it's going to be used for the next phase I have, for the next step I'm being taken to. All of it will be used for his glory, right? So the only failure is when you quit. Sometimes we may start to want to please God or work so we can see the blessings God has laid up for us in our own life. And since the pain and failure is not God's best, we feel we must please God to get the additional blessing. You know, when I say that, I mean this. So many times we're looking for the extra blessing, the new blessing. The, but, but we received everything when we received Christ. We received it all. It's all in there. It's like this old uh, tomato sauce commercial, ragu. It's in there. Everything was in there, right? And we, it's all in there. The problem is we're limiting its ability to magn be magnified in our life. So we, it says that we start to maybe start, to, well, maybe if I go to church more, maybe if I start helping in children's church, then I'll see the blessing. Maybe if I, and there's always that thing of wanting to see the blessing in your life. You want to see the abundance in your life, and you're thinking you're almost cutting a deal with God, right? I don't know if I'm the only one that's ever done that, but. So at this point, we could start our journey of legalism, dead work, self-absorption, and frustration, because we're doing all this stuff, but we're not seeing the things in our life that we want to see. We okay? All right. You see, there's not a single thing we can do to attain more of God's favor than we receive through the acceptance of Jesus in our life. We received all God had to give. We received the entire blessing package. If you look at it as a package, here's the package. You got it. You got it all. Now, how do we utilize it? How do we wield it in our life? says in 2 Peter 1, 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, not some of the things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Given us all things. It's in there. 
Looking for ways to earn or obtain a new blessing or an increased blessing always causes us to look someplace other than to the Lord Jesus and his finished work. We get into works, right? So if, and if any of this, I mean, I've done this in my life. If any of this is in your life, this is not the right thing. This is not what we're supposed to do. You've already got all the blessing in you. Okay, did I say? Okay. To attain this peace we seek in our life, a, a disciple builds his life on the teaching of his master, Lord Jesus. For us, we look to his word and his example to us. We must read and understand the word to attain peace in our life. I'm sorry, but this is the truth. We got to read the book or quit complaining about what we got in our lives. You got to read the Bible. You got to know the Bible. It's the book on how to live life and find peace in your life. It's the book. Now, the guy says, here's all the answers. And we say, well, yeah, but I ain't got time for that. I'm busy. You know, I got to vacuum the rug. I've got to cut the lawn. I got stuff I got to do. But the book of life and the book of peace, I I ain't got time to read that. But the pastor will tell me what I need to know. And then you put all the responsibility on the pastor, but God wants a special individual relationship with you, and he does it through his word. So the commitment would be now, I am going to read that Bible because I want to know what it has in there for me. And there's some things in there just for you, no one else, just for you. And you steal them from the rest of the body when you don't go read that book because you're supposed to give it to everyone, right? And I want what you got laid up for you when you're digging into that word and you're going to give me that revelation. I'm going to go, wow, I never saw it that way. Isn't that awesome? right? You see, when we deal with a fruit problem in our life, we can't spend all our time picking up the bad fruit. It's just going to grow back. So we must go to the source of the bad fruit and deal with the root of our problem, right? If we don't deal with the root of the problem and free ourselves from the pain of the past, we will continue to bring that pain forward into our now and into our future, We relive an old pain over and over and over and over again, right? Well, you know, I was abused as a kid. My dad told me I'm no good. And then everywhere you go, you carry that burden with you. And it shows up in every aspect of your life. And so because we haven't released it, we get to experience it in every place we go in life. And then we don't see the blessing we should have in our life, that he's laid up for us. But, you know, since the beginning, it's been about choice. We make the choice. You know, in the garden, they made the choice to eat of the the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? It's always about choice. God doesn't want drones. He wants you to choose life. Okay. Emotional pains becomes the window or our glasses we see the world through. What we focus on, we get more of. Example. Michelle gave me, Michelle Fisher gave me these yellow glasses, okay? Now, I had some pain in my life. My dad told me I would never amount to anything. He put me down all the time. And so I started to look at the world through the pain of what my father had taught me. So every time I looked, I saw through these glasses, right? So you can tell me how amazing your life is, and I can look at the same thing like Michelle's white shirt, and all I see is yellow. That's not white, that's yellow. No, no, that's you. you can tell me, you can t- show me the word, you can bless me, but I haven't let go of that thing, so I see all life in yellow or through my pain. Does that make sense? However, the person next to me <laughs> sees their life through their pain of red. You, you see, because they were raised and they were the one that wasn't taken care of in their family and they were adopted and all this. And so they see everything in the pain of red. And so now we've got one seeing through the pain of yellow who knows they're right and one seeing through the pain of red who knows they're right. And the fact is you keep bringing it with you everywhere you go because you're looking through the glasses of whatever pain you haven't released in your life. Does that make sense? Okay. So... And again, this was a demo a buddy of mine, Brian Clemmer, used to do all the time. 
he'd say, you know, you're looking through life through your glasses that you were raised with. So he would do a, a whole thing on these with big old funny glasses. I didn't have funny enough glasses, but the idea is the same. They're funny? You took a picture of it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, but they were funny without the glasses, weren't they? When we deal with the root and remove our old pain, we then can live from a place of peace and freedom from fear or future pain. We make different decisions. Our yoke becomes easy and our burden light. We actually start to see God's blessing in our life. You know, sometimes, especially in relationships, well, husband and wife, you may say something to someone that triggers an old pain that they've never released. And they attack you assuming they know why you said what you said because that's the way it's been in their life. And because it's the way it's been in life, they're attacking that thing again, that thing again, that thing again, and then you get the fruit of what your attack brings back to you, and then you're right. You see, you're always right. Whatever you think is going to happen is right. I knew they would do that. I knew they would take advantage of me. I knew they were going to do it that way, and you're right. Right? Right? unless we repent, think a new way. So we must now commit ourselves fully to the principles that we recognize as spirituality, sound from the knowledge of the word, and in that commitment, we will find freedom from pain in our lives. So we're going to have to bounce everything off the word, see if it, so we can free ourselves from this pain. Example would be, I'm going to give it a little example of my own life. When, you know, I saw my father, and he made fun of me in front of all of my friends, my dad was this big, giant man with a loud voice, much louder than mine. In, in, my, in my family, I'm the quiet one, just so you know. They're like, I have six brothers and sisters, and I am truly the quiet one. Believe, is it truth, baby? I'm the quiet one because they're whacked out. They're nuts. But that's your family, right? So uh, <laughs> I hope you're not hearing this, son. Oh, it's not on good. Is it on? Oh, it's on. Oh, that's bad. Anyway. <laughs> So my father, while we were marching, singing, <laughs> we didn't just sing Christmas carols. We would march and sing Christmas carols, right? And we'd go right between houses, had a good home with your left, you're right. Jody was there when you left, you're right. And so we're marching from house to house to sing God's songs in a warrior-like way. And uh, so I was having a great time, and I was marching kind of funky, and I was just feeling great. And Dad says, what are you, some kind of an idiot? Look at you, you're embarrassing me. And he said this in front of all my friends and all the neighborhood because we had about 40 people, and it crushed me. So then I start looking at the world through those glasses that I'm not enough, and my, my dad's embarrassed by me. And then and that's how I started seeing everything. As I got older, I decided that I didn't want to carry that pain anymore. So I went back in time. We can do this. We travel time like it's nothing. We go back in time, and I redefined the significance of that moment. I redefined it. I, I went, oh, my gosh. Well, my dad was working three jobs. It's Christmas Eve. He doesn't have any money for Christmas for us kids. He's doing the All that is what did the blurt, the yelling to me. He was really yelling at himself in the circumstances and situations. When I saw that and I forgave him for that because it was just what was going on, it released all this burden off of me. And then I could see the world through the right glasses, not through the glasses that I wasn't enough, that I would never be enough. So you can travel back in time to forgive people that even died. Because the greatest gift you give yourself is when you release that judgment, you, you actually release the burden you're carrying. And everything in your life can change, right? Okay. So... Let's discuss judgment and how that contributes to pain in our lives. This is the number one producer of pain in our lives. Judgment. What is judgment? What is judgment? Give me an example of judgment. Come on, Bob. Say something. Point you out. You're in the front row. You must know something. Your kids. What about your kids? You place judgment upon them. How about judgment in your life? What judgments do you see in your life? Anyone? This. Oh, they're all nuts, aren't they? 
they're idiots. Everybody but you on the street is an idiot, right? So, so you judge them right away, right? Because you know that they should be doing just what you're doing. Politics, they should agree with you because you know the right way. You can see through the right glasses. Obviously, God, please remove the scales from their eyes. Your co-workers, right? Yeah, because they don't act like you. They don't treat you the way you'd want to be treated. Other Christians, whoa, other Christians. That's a big one, isn't it? Don't they read the same word I read? And it says in the Bible... Judge ourself. There's one of the biggest ones. When we judge ourselves, what are we doing? We beat the heck out of ourselves that we're not good enough. That why didn't I do it better? Why is my kid this way? Why is my child that way? That's my fault. Or they have a choice to make their own decision, which is more empowering for them than you, right? Okay, so who's supposed to judge others biblically? Anyone in the classroom here? Who said that? Well, you cheat. She said Jesus. It says, John 5, 22, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all the judgment unto the Son. He's the one that's going to judge us. God loves us. As soon as we receive Christ in our life, we're good. Right? Right? Now, we may not see all the fruit in our life that he was hoping for. He's all laid it up for us. All we got to do is get in alignment with it. But Jesus is the judge. Why would he be the judge? He's walked our walk. He knows what it's like to be a human. He knows what it's like to walk this planet with all the temptations everywhere. That's the guy I want to judge because he didn't make any mistakes. Right? Webster's defined judgment as the determination of the mind formed from comparing the relations of ideas or the comparison of facts and arguments to your personal ideas. In other words, anybody who doesn't agree with you should be judged. Right? But yet you were raised in the way that you knew everything. You were raised in the way the, the things in life happened to you, and so you formed judgments based on those things, but they didn't walk the same walk you walked but why don't they just agree with me? Can't they see? I, they should know it's this way. So I judge them for that. All right. How can we compare others to us and our personal ideas and judge them? We are not perfect like Jesus is. And our judgment, it's flawed. It's based on our glasses. We judge based on the circumstances we've been through in our life. So our judgment of anyone or anything is flawed. That's why we got to keep going back to the Word and understanding what it says. And then <laughs> it's really hard. This is the thing you got to do. Read it not through these glasses or else you're going to try to twist it into what you think it should say so it agrees with what you already think. Read it with the glasses removed from a place of truth. Right? Even if it doesn't agree with what you believe already, it might be the thing that's holding you back. How many times have you read a Bible scripture a hundred times and then one day you go, bing, whoa, that's amazing. I never, I read that a hundred times. I can quote it 50 times and I didn't know it said that. And then when you know, you can apply it in your life, right? All right. In the formation of our judgment, we should be careful to weigh and compare all the facts connected with the subject. Do we know why they do what they do? Or do we assume to know why? The only way to judge others is by comparing them to our own ideals, which are flawed as well. Judgment, though pronounced by the judge, court, or individual, is properly to determine a sentence under the law. So when you judge somebody, you sentence them under the law. Right? Matter of fact, you don't want to hang out with them. There's a sentence. I will not spend time with you. I have judged you. You have tattoos. You cannot be in this church, you evil person. Look at this, that short skirt. My gosh, get her away from Jezebel spirit. Just some of the things we judge as Christians. You are gay. Stay away from me and my church. I'll get into that a little bit more. Not too much. Are we under the law? No. 
You see, we can't stop pain from coming into our life until we are willing to stop judging. We can't get rid of the pain of our past until you're willing to let go and redefine the judgment we put on the situation or circumstance in the past, or we will still feel the pain and judgment now and in our future. We still have our pain glasses on, as we talked about. Judge not that ye be not judged, right? For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote in, that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? And finally, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, I, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You see, if we take this in context with this te his teachings in Matthew, it has been misinterpreted many times in the body of Christ and by the church that we have been uh, taught it means that God will judge us. But this isn't so. God sees us as sinless. Always sinless. Because we've accepted Christ in our life, right? So we're sinless. So who's judging us? Who's the only one that should judge? We talked about that. Jesus. Hmm. So who's judging us if we judge others? Well, we see men and women give to us when we give to others, right? Given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And we'll get from others through the hands of man the wealth that we're going to have in our life, right? Okay. Clothing, okay. whether it be riches, food, mercy, kindness, clothing, or judgment, anger, and condemnation, it shall be given back to you by men, not God. If you're wondering why all heck's breaking loose in your life, and all these people are judging you, and you're not seeing the things you should do, you got to look at you and what judgment you're holding that's creating that in your life. See, that's an empowerment thing. You can fix you but it's the only person you can fix. We want to try to fix others because it makes us feel good at how loser they are. Oh, wow. Look at them. They're messed up. And it'd make us feel much better to fix them because then we don't have to look at ourselves. But the only person we can fix is ourselves, right? So God has already forgiven all our sin. He is not judging us. We have already been judged. We are forgiven. Hallelujah. Law of sowing and reaping, law of seed time and harvest, they'll be with you always. What you plant is going to come back as a fruit. Judgment is a seed, and that seed bringeth forth the fruit of that seed. Let's go to Luke and see what we're taught there. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. It's telling us all the stuff that, you know, how many times have, have my wife and I given to people, and then I had my knee operated on, and I had so much food I didn't know what to do. That's a fruit of what we did. And it was given to us by men, right? So I planted good seed, and we got good fruit. And it was reciprocated back to us. Luke, give mercy, forgiveness, food, monies, and judgment, anger, or fear, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that you met, with all it shall be measured to you again. So do we believe that men is going to be the one giving back to us? God has laid everything up for us. He's done. He's finished. It's there, right? But we get the blessing through the hands of man. We get stuff. He works through men, right? But if we condemn men, how much of a blessing are we going to receive from those people, right? So 
Let's look at the same typical Christian judgments of the world. The world hates Christians because we judge the world, and that judgment produces fruit based on that seed. Therefore, we are judged. But God so loved the world. <laughs> what? Well, I hate the world. I can't wait to get out of here. Rapture, please, get me out of here. This place is messed up. I'm flat busted and disgusted. I need to go to heaven where I got my mansion. Right? Or gays are ousted and cast out in the church. We ostracize them, talk about them, and push them away like lepers. Therefore, we are hated by gays and others. The church should be the place where gays are allowed to come. Because no sin is greater than any other sin. Well, I'm into pornography, but, you know, that's accepted. I'm, I'm an alcoholic, but come on to the church. It's okay. I'm a drug addict. Come on. It's okay. I judge people. That's all right. You're gay? Oh, my gosh. Stay back. But when we accept them into the only place that we can fix them, where they can be fixed, we don't fix them, where they can be fixed and the Holy Spirit can work on them, it's that love that we have for them, that unconditional love, that not condemnation but love, that changes them because God does the changing through the Holy Spirit. Is that right? So we don't hate gays. We always hate the sin of any of those sins. But we don't hate the people. We war against prince, principalities, powers of darkness. We don't war against people. We love them. I love Obama. That was hard to say. But I'm working on it. You see, judgment keeps us in conflict, and judgment sets ourselves up as God, as Jesus. Jesus does the condemning. We judge. We say, where's Jesus? Hey, he don't know what he's talking about. I got this one. You're judged. And we just sat in the wrong seat. We sat in the authority seat that we judge you. Hmm. John 5, 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. We said that three times. I want to make sure we get it. A few more judgments that actually pit Christian against Christian. What about celebrating Christmas? I'm not letting that heathen Christmas tree into my house, right? Because we know we've studied the Or you know, Christmas... <laughs> You know, that really happened in May or June. It didn't happen in December because the, the sheeps in the middle of the cow, all that stuff's not happening at that time. It's happening not in December because it's too cold. It's happening in May or June. So you find a flaw and you say, the, throw the whole thing out. It says, are we idolaters because Jesus was born in May or June? Not in December. Therefore, we receive judgment and hatred by other Christians, and the body of Christ itself becomes much weaker because we have divided ourselves with our judgment of each other. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. What makes us so weak is that we, we, we judge others' beliefs. Well, I, we speak in tongues. We believe in We don't believe in tongues. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in this. We, and we set up religions and divisions and all this stuff, and it makes us so weak. But if we believe that you received Jesus as the Son of God, you believe that he was born of a virgin, he suffered, died, buried, rose on the third day, and his kingdom will have no end, and he's coming back, you're my brother. All the other stuff don't matter. If we could just focus on that, not focus on the little, the, not strain, <laughs> swallow the camel, but strain the gnat, we would be so much better off. But it makes us feel more comfortable when we're righteous in our stance because we don't like that person. We don't like what they say. We don't like what they do. Why do we do what we do? What is our heart? Only God and Jesus knows for sure. And I say that, I, I did have up there, only we, God, and Jesus know for sure. But a lot of times, I don't even know why I do what I do. You know, it was programmed in there a long time ago when I was a little one. Or it got to me, passed on from generation to generation. I mean, why did I like alcohol so much? Why did I drink like I drank? Because my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather, great they drank like crazy. And I would, I had, they used to put, alcohol on my gums when I was teething. 
right? Because it takes the pain away. Really, it took the pain away of the parents because you were crying so much, so they'd knock you out. Here's a little alcohol. Put it on his gums. He'll be good. <laughs> Only God and Jesus knows for sure. Many times we ourselves don't even know why we did the thing we did. As it's programmed in us as a curse, or it can be a curse when passed on through the generations, or placed in us as a truth at a very young age when we could not defend ourselves. I mean, how much prejudice is set up from what you were raised in? You know, you hate him because that person's black, or that person's Chinese, and you just hate him because that's the way you were raised. You got to hate that. Why? Uh, it's the way it is. My dad hates it. My grandfather hates it. Did you ever think or choose? I, I am a religion because that's the way my mother thought or my father. No, you got to have a personal relationship. And we just carry on whatever burdens my parents carried with me. Does that make sense? Yet many Christians are adamant about the Christmas tree or tongues or the body or the blood of Christ, the Eucharist. You know, Catholics believe it's the actual miracle every time you have the body and blood. Uh, Christians believe that it's just a symbol. It don't matter. They both believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They both believe he was born a virgin. They both believe he suffered, died, and buried, raised on the third day, and he will come in glory, judge the living and the dead. I'm good. You're my brother. It says uh, that they should not be allowed in the house as anyone who does celebrate the pagan holiday of Christmas. You know, Christmas came about because um, the um, old Catholics back in that day were pretty smart. They already had a holiday at that, at that, on December 25th. So what they did was they said, well, how can we take the holiday they're already celebrating, put a Christian meaning on it, and let them keep celebrating because they want to celebrate? Right? It was called the Carnania or something like that. I have a whole teaching on that. But the point is, they, they just plugged and chugged different holidays on different dates because they were already celebrating. The heathen were already celebrating. So that way they'd be celebrating for the right thing, not for the wrong thing. We focus on our differences, not our similarities. And we judge these differences because we know better in the body of Christ and we weaken the body because all we all... Because as we all know, what we focus on, we get more of. So we keep focusing on each other's differences. We keep getting more of each other's differences, and we get weaker as a body. And all you can see is your differences. Is that true? Because what you focus on, you get more of. You know, I know this is coming up, and I know I'm going to do great. And it's, here's, here's mine. And I'm almost to the finish line, but something's going to come up. And I'm right. It's like the frog that jumps halfway to the finish line. He jumps halfway, and then the next jump is halfway, and then the next jump is halfway of that. And you never get to the finish line because you keep going halfway, and that program runs in my brain, and it prevents me from seeing the abundance that God has laid up for me. Because that's what I believe is going to happen, because I'm expecting it, so therefore I'm right. These guys have created, created it in my own life. So I have to redefine that. Truthfully and simply, when we pass judgment on others, we step into idolatry, and we judge what is set up for only Jesus to judge. We assume we know the individual's motives and heart. We become God. We become Jesus. Not a good place to be. What is the heart of judgment? One is automatically in the judgment. Uh, it says one is in automatically in, that's not even a good sentence, but <laughs> when we assume we know why someone does what they do, that's the key. We assume we know why someone does what they do. You know, we're sitting there, and a guy is going real slow in his car, and we know he's playing on his phone. And I'm mad at that guy playing on his phone because I know he's doing that. Actually, the dude's suffering, and he's coughing, and he's having a tough time, but I already put my meaning on it, and as he goes by, I'm, like, giving him the look, like, come on, you want to play? He's coughing. This is what happened in my life. I'm like, oh, now I feel terrible, but then it's like you go to yourself, how many times does this show up in my life? How many times do I apply a why to what they did? 
As soon as I apply a why, I'm in judgment. It's not that it did. Did is okay. That's what happened. It's when you apply a why to what they did. That's when you're in judgment. So 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height or stat of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh at the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh at the heart. That's why two people can do the same exact thing. And one, it's okay, and the other one's not okay. The fruit they've got is bad fruit or good fruit because the heart was right. It was given from a place that they really wanted to give. Or one was given from a place where they wanted to be all about them and be in control and be the big guy. One's good, but the actions were the same. Does that make sense? Can we see into the heart of others? Do we know the road they walked and why they did what they did? I think not. And if we assume we do, then we usurp God and Jesus' position in judgment. Additional scriptures supporting who judges? Psalms. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Paul says about eating idols' food, any of them that believeth not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. In other words, you know, he was eating the food that was being sacrificed to idols, all right? So people from around there is judging him. His heart wasn't about that. His heart was, how can I form a common union with these people so that I can let them see the truth of the word and come into the kingdom? And so he formed a common union. But his heart wasn't about eating idol, uh, idols' food and worshiping idols. But he was judged. Uh, we're not going to go into that. Healing. And he saith unto them, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day to do, uh, or to do evil, to save life or to kill. They judge Jesus based on the fact that he did a healing on the Sabbath, if you remember that. And he, his heart was right. He wasn't under the law. He did what he should do. But yet all those around him judged him. You see, truly judgment is a form of control. You're trying to control the actions of someone around you. And if they don't conform with what you think you should, what you would have done, they're judged. So you're trying to control them. By judging what they do, and more importantly, why they do it, when we judge other, others, Paul says, we are weak in faith. So when we're judging somebody, we're what? Well, we think we're being all righteous. But the word says we're weak in faith. Paul says in Romans 14, 1, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations for one believe believeth that he may eat all things another who is weak eateth herbs herb eating judges the herb eater judges the guy that's eating the meat and the meat eater judges the guy that's eating the herbs let's not let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth for God hath received him just because they're doing something different than you, they might be in a different place of growth than you are. We all grow and we go through stuff. And how many things have you done in the past that you realize, oh man, that's not right. But your heart wasn't bad back then. You just thought it's what you do. But then the revelation came that it wasn't the right thing. So it's not our job to judge, uh, judge those people. It's their job, the Holy Spirit's job, to help them through that stuff. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So we can't judge another one because he's a disciple of Christ. Christ will do the judging. Not us. It's not our job. We're out of order. 
It all boils down to seed time and harvest. Whatever seed we plant, we will yield after its own kind and manifest into its own into our life. And we will receive this fruit from others. God has already given us everything, and he loves us unconditionally. The word teaches us about how to live on this planet in peace, love, and freedom. Example of judgment, clothes. <laughs> There's a story. I was uh, driving with a friend, I don't know, it was about 20-some years ago, before before Michelle, BM. And I'm driving down the road, and the, uh, the window in the back is open in this car that we're in, and the um, clothes start flying out. Her clothes are flying out the back side of the window. So I yell, hey, what are you doing? And yell, because the clothes are flying out. She automatically assumed that I was yelling at her about something that she had already formed a program about, how she got yelled at as a kid, and started screaming and yelling at me. Because I was not respecting her. I was not giving her the prop. And then finally, when it was all over, I was like, your clothes just flew out the window. That's why I was yelling at you. But she assumed she knew my why. And as soon as she assumed she knew my why, she lost all her clothes, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said it was before Michelle, so you didn't have to take any of that. How dare you? She assumed I was yelling because I was angry. She felt insulted. She felt abused. She felt rejected. She assumed to know why I was yelling. Uh, but yet I meant it all for good. But she experienced this as a bad in her life. Due to her, the judgment of my action, she assumed she knew why I did it. So here's a little exercise. List the judgments you are receiving in your life. And it can just be one. And ask the Holy Spirit how you planted the seed that bears this fruit in your life. That's the hardest thing is sitting down and why do I think this way? And why do I keep getting back this negativity because of this seed I planted? This way I'm thinking, right? And it says, discuss this with a person next to you that you are not married to, not genetic family with, because we're all family in here. And we are all family. Well, I said that. So don't be afraid of judgment, but be open to, to, to what they have to share with you or what you have to share with them. Because you see, when you bring it out into light, you can actually do something about it. Right? But if you keep it hidden in the dark, it keeps getting you. And it keeps getting you. And you keep tripping over it every single time. Bring it out into light. There it is. Got to do something about it. Does that make sense? So... On Wednesday, we're going to discuss how to break this power of pain in our lives. We're going to go through a bunch of how-tos because I believe any teaching that doesn't have a how-to implemented in your life doesn't have a value because we got the, the concept. Now we got to know how can I actually do this in my life, right? So we want to teach how to. So right now, just take a couple of minutes. Talk with somebody about maybe a judgment you have in your life. Maybe it was something I mentioned and what the fruit of that judgment looks like in your life. Because we, are we all living in abundance? Are we all living in health, wealth, prosperity, peace, and joy? Are we all living in shalom? No. Should we be? Yes. Something's stopping it. So we're going to find out what's stopping it because we're going to seek it. We're going to find it. We're going to see it. And then we're going to do something about it. Okay?